Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. What is Vladimir Putin capable of? In less than a month, he has made refugees of more than two and a half million Ukrainians. His forces have laid waste to entire cities and killed thousands of people. He's lost scores of his own ill-prepared, poorly-led, invading soldiers. The Russian war on Ukraine has not gone according to Putin's plan. But there is no indication that he's ready to slow down, even with much of the international community united against Putin. So how long can it last and how bad can it get? To try and understand the answers to those vital questions, we need to look at Chechnya. Yeah, Chechnya, the majority Muslim former Soviet Republic in the Caucasus that successfully declared its independence after the Cold War and fought Russian troops to a stalemate in the mid-1990s. But fast forward to 1999 and things changed. On August 7th, Chechen forces entered neighboring Dagestan. They were there to help rebels seeking to declare that republic's independence from Russia. Just a week after that, Russia's parliament picked its next prime minister, an obscure city official and ally of President Boris Yeltsin named Vladimir Putin. The following month, September 1999, apartment blocks in four major Russian cities, including Moscow, were firebombed, killing more than 300 innocent people and stoking fear across the country. Putin, whose ascent had been stymied by corruption and infighting within his party, found a new way to brand himself as a man with a plan to rid Russia of rebellious republics and evil terrorist attacks. By the end of the month, Putin had blamed Chechnya for the bombings, declared that its president and legislature were illegitimate supporters of Islamist terrorism, and launched a new war to make Chechnya safe by making it Russian. Even today, it's difficult to understand the devastating cost of the Second Chechen War, as it's now known. For 10 long years... Russia bombed that small republic into oblivion. More than 100,000 people died on all sides of a conflict that was marked by assassinations, by rape and looting, by the use of cluster munitions and other alleged war crimes. But nothing could compare to the Russian siege of Grozny, the Chechen capital. It was laid to waste in a way humanity had not seen since World War II, reduced to rubble and ash. In 2002, the United Nations declared Grozny the most destroyed city on earth. It had once been a vibrant city of 400,000 residents. Today, the Russian-controlled population of Grozny is still three quarters of what it once was. And the entire Russian offensive may have been based on a lie. Imagine that. A false flag, in fact. Several men tasked with investigating the 1999 Russian apartment bombings, the ones used to justify Russia's offensive, began to suspect those attacks were orchestrated by the Kremlin to drum up support for war in Chechnya. One of those investigators was arrested a week before he was to present his findings in court. Another died of a mysterious illness in 2003. That same year, another was shot dead. Alexander Litvinenko, an ex-KGB agent who sought asylum in the UK, wrote an entire book accusing Putin's government of bombing those apartments. He died of radiation poisoning in 2006. A British inquiry concluded he was killed by two Russians, likely on Putin's orders. Meanwhile, independent Russian journalists tried telling the truth about Russia's alleged atrocities in Chechnya, like Anna Politkovskaya, who wrote several books about Russian war crimes and the murderous Chechen forces backed by Moscow. She was shot dead in the elevator of her apartment building in 2006. Russia's war in Chechnya gave Vladimir Putin what he wanted, a Russian client government in what was left of Grozny, led today by a bloodthirsty Chechen warlord named Ramzan Kadyrov, who liquidated the country's refugee camps and has rounded up and tortured gays and lesbians there. Where is Kadyrov now, you may ask? Well, yesterday, the Kremlin-aligned strongman said he was actually in Ukraine, participating in the fighting, and he released a video claiming to show him with other Chechen soldiers just 20 kilometers outside of Kyiv. That video has not been verified by NBC News. He called on Ukrainian forces to surrender, or you will be finished. Think about all the parallels. Then Russia was stamping out terrorism. Now it's taking on neo-Nazis. Then it was carrying out retribution for apartment bombings by terrorists. Now it's responding to the threat of biolabs. Then it was using thermobaric weapons and cluster bombs. Now it's again using thermobaric weapons and cluster bombs, even though it denies using them again. 
Then it was Putin giving power to the Kadyrov gang. Now the Kadyrov gang says it's fighting in Ukraine for Putin. Then it was the complete destruction of Grozny. What is the parallel to that? Here's what British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said earlier this month. If you're sitting where, where he is, his only instinct is going to be to double down and to, to try to Groznify uh, Kiev, if you know what I mean. Uh, and to, and to, and to, and to just reduce it to, to rubble. To reduce it to, and I think that would, of course, I think that would be uh, an unutterable uh, moral uh, uh, humanitarian catastrophe. To Groznify Kiev, it's chilling and completely consistent with what we've seen already in Ukrainian cities like Mariupol, which, like Grozny, had a population of 400,000, akin to Cleveland or New Orleans, and which has been turned to rubble and fires, killing thousands, according to the Ukrainian government. Just last week, the world witnessed the destruction of a maternity hospital that Russia first denied bombing, then claimed was full of neo-Nazis, not pregnant women. We learned today that one of those pregnant women who was photographed on a stretcher amid the destruction died last week, along with her unborn child. Vladimir Putin bombarded Grozny for a decade and handed the remnants over to a thug. But barely three weeks into the Ukraine war, he is besieging the people of Mariupol and Kharkiv and, yes, Kiev itself. How many more Groznys is he capable of creating? And is there any way of preventing him doing so? Joining me now, Tom DeWall. He reported on the first and second Chechen wars and is now a senior fellow with Carnegie Europe. And David Filipov, he covered Russia's wars in Chechnya as Moscow bureau chief for the Boston Globe. He was later the Moscow bureau chief for the Washington Post. Thank you both for joining me tonight. David, let me start with you. What was it like in Chechnya then? And how bloody did Putin's hands get? For the Russian military, like we saw in Ukraine, went in thinking this was going to be a 48-hour operation, drove armor into uh, cities, and very quickly got stopped and very badly beaten, after which the whole war started progressively taking on this character that we're now also seeing in Ukraine. Uh, towns and cities would be surrounded. Uh, the word would be on Russian TV that there are terrorists inside. Uh, the bombardment would start. Uh, that would make it impossible for people to live there. They'd create refugees. The refugees would try to get out. And then the idea was kill the rest of the defenders. And when the second war started in 1999, as you mentioned in your intro, it only got worse and the devastation greater and the determination of the Russian forces to flatten things um, became more prevalent. And Tom, you also reported on Chechnya during that period. What lessons do you think Vladimir Putin brought forward from the Chechen wars? And how are we seeing those maybe play out in Ukraine today? Well, I'm not sure that he's necessarily learned the lessons. I mean, the parallel actually that, that, that strikes me is actually from 1994, the, the, the first Chechen war, which was really the one I covered. Um, and I think he's, he's making exactly the same miscalculation that actually Boris Yeltsin, who launched that war, uh, made back in 1994, thinking that, that um, it would all be over very quickly. His defense minister said it would be over in 48 hours with one parachute regiment, that the um, Chechen government would be decapitated, people would welcome them as liberators, um, and then this would be a great victory at home and, and, and everyone would get back to normal. And clearly, um, Yeltsin was uh, misinformed. Um, the Chechens, who didn't actually particularly like their, their president, um, he was, I think, less popular by a, a big margin than Zelensky is now. They certainly rallied round as soon as the Russian troops came in. Um, they forgot um, their domestic differences. They fought back. And as David has said, um, when a ground offensive uh, ground to a halt in Grozny, they um, ruthlessly just turned to kind of World War II methods of air power, artillery, urban warfare, and it got absolutely hideous. And, and I'm afraid we're just seeing a replay of that. And also, I would add that they don't have, just as in Chechnya, they don't have an alternative leader. Um, many of the kind of swing voters, the alternative leaders that they had in Chechnya, as soon as they saw what the Russians were doing, they certainly didn't want to back the Russian invasion. I think yes, um, many point. of the Russian speakers in, in Chechnya 
uh, in, sorry, the Russian speakers in Ukraine who might, um, you know, have not exactly welcomed this, but certainly not resisted, I think that, that they're changing their minds when they see what the Russians are up to right now. And David, Chechnya has a population of less than 1.5 million. Ukraine has, what, 30 times that, around 44 million? How 44 bad million. can it get in Ukraine today, do you think? Well, again, as Tom said, the mistake that Putin made here in Ukraine is the same one that the Russians made in Chechnya, which is that people in Chechnya wanted to be Chechens as soon as the troops come in. Now everybody's a fighter. Wars of occupation are very difficult because it turns out that maybe they were indifferent before about whether they're Ukraine, whether they're Russians in Ukraine. Now you have a country of 44 million people that doesn't want to be occupied. It's an impossible tax for the troops, for the amount of troops that Putin has in there now. Um, what is it, 140,000? That's impossible to occupy that size. To give you an example, Russia had several divisions in Chechnya and was not able to pacify Chechnya because wherever they would chase the um, insurgents out, they'd pop up someplace else. I mean, we've seen this yeah. from the United States in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's very difficult to win a war of occupation. Tom, what do you make of this claim by Ramzan Kadyrov uh, over the past 24 hours, this pro-Putin Chechen leader, that he's in Ukraine, he claims, and also of Putin's reliance on Chechen fighters more generally? Well, it, it's quite plausible. I mean, um, Ramzan Kadyrov, he has a brand. He's, he's, he's the tough guy who supposedly chased out the Islamic terrorists in Chechnya, which he did to a certain extent, but by replacing them with something equally brutal, which was his own... Um, kind of sultanist, despotic rule in in Chechnya with, with no opposition. So he has a kind of brand that he's that he's uh, Vladimir Putin's best friend. He obviously owes Putin for everything, and he you know he sent supposedly sent people to Syria, and it's quite plausible uh, that he's that he's turned up uh, in Ukraine. But we would just just add that the, the the irony of this is that this is supposedly started as a kind of Putin's war to win back a Slavic Russian people who belong to Russia. And, um, and he sent Islamic Chechens there, and he's now talking about sending Syrians there, which is a sign really of yes. how badly that, 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 that kind of Russian Slavic crusade is going for him. Because he has to fight the Nazis, Tom. He's fighting the Nazis in Ukraine, so he tells us every day. Uh, David, let's talk about some of the important differences between Chechnya and Ukraine, the first one being that the West was reaching out to Putin and engaging with him while he was laying waste to Grozny. There was no isolation back then. George W. Bush was looking into Putin's eyes and getting a sense of his soul. British Prime Minister Tony Blair was calling him a reformer, going to the opera with him. Uh, uh, today, the West has made a pariah out of Putin. Why the difference? Is it because Chechnya was Muslim and more easily painted as a terrorist state? No. Bill Clinton, when he called Boris Yeltsin in 1996, the Abraham Lincoln of Russia, was talking as an ally who wanted post-Soviet Russia to be part of the democratic nations of, of Europe. The idea was that, he, and even Putin in 1999, when he took over in 2000, he promised to continue the reforms. There were suspicions because this is a former KGB lieutenant colonel, but the idea is Russia is a democratic country, or we want it to be, that's dealing with an insurgency. Uh, that faded. But I mean, even in 2002, uh, you know, Chechens were put on the list of State what? Department terrorist what? groups. None of that yeah. in Ukraine. Ukraine is a country that borders NATO. There's four NATO or five NATO countries. I don't have my map in front of me and showing my ignorance. It's a completely different deal. It's right out in front of everybody that this is all just a land grab, a power grab. And we've been yeah. watching it for eight years. We'll have to leave it there. Tom DeWall and David Phillip have a fascinating discussion. Appreciate both of your insights. Thank you. The Pentagon says that the Russian convoy is still stalled in its advance towards the capital, Kyiv. But Russia has been escalating its attacks on the city over the weekend. Artillery fire hit a nine-story apartment building in the north of the city, killing two people. NBC's Richard Engel filed this report from the scene. Fortunately, if you can describe anything like this as, as, as fortunate, 
The building was largely evacuated at the time. About half the people, uh, according to residents, had already left. But many people had decided to stay behind. Many people now have to find other places to live. Some residents here who are just collecting whatever they can salvage from this building say they now are going to either live in shelters or with relatives in other parts of the city. Richard Engel reporting there. A fourth round of high-level talks between Ukraine and Russia ended earlier today with no breakthroughs. Negotiators are set to speak again tomorrow. Here in the U.S., the top House and Senate Democrats announced that Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky will give a virtual address to members of Congress on Wednesday. Over the weekend, he made a surprise visit to wounded Ukrainian soldiers at a military hospital. He took photos with service members and presented medals for bravery. Joining me now, Oleksiy Sorokin, political editor for the Kyiv Independent. He's with us tonight from Western Ukraine near the Romanian border. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. How bad have things become on the ground where you are in recent days? Well, Western Ukraine is obviously safer than the rest of Ukraine, but we saw uh, airstrikes by Russia, uh, for example, the Yavoriv uh, airfield near Lviv. So we now understand that the whole country is a target, and I think that's one of the goals for Russia. And these high-level negotiations between uh, Russian and Ukrainian negotiators that are set to pick up again on Tuesday morning, there were no breakthroughs in today's meetings. Are we seeing any indications at all of progress there towards a ceasefire or some kind of substantive diplomacy? Unfortunately, no. We know that uh, Russians and Ukrainians have been meeting for over the past Last week, nothing came out of it. The main question right now for Ukraine is to establish a humanitarian corridor to Mariupol, uh, a southern uh, city which is bombarded by Russia, which is encircled, where people lack food, medicine, water. So this is the number one priority for Ukraine. In fact, the president's administration said that a humanitarian co convoy was sent to the city and is now blocked by Russia. So we hope that something is going to come out of those talks. But unfortunately, there's zero indication that something is going to happen. Alexei, you're the political editor of the Kyiv Independent newspaper. What is the domestic political situation, if I can call it that, when it comes to support for President Zelensky's handling of this conflict? He has truly united your nation in a way most people never imagined before, has he not? Yes, um, I think the popular support for Zelensky is way over 90% of the country. Uh, even those people who tended to sympathize with Russia or with uh, even Putin uh, now are uh, pro-Ukrainian. We know that many members of parliament who were seen as pro-Russian are now uh, vocally pro-Ukrainian. Yes. So I think this attack by Russia has made the whole country unite and unite around Zelensky. Yes, a, a serious miscalculation by President Putin. President Zelensky is set to address the U.S. Congress this week. There is some daylight, to put it mildly, between the White House and Congress on the question of whether to transfer warplanes from Poland to Ukraine and a range of views on this question of whether to bring in a quote-unquote no-fly zone with all the risks that entails. What tone should we expect from President Zelensky before the United States Congress on Wednesday? Well, Zelensky knows that he's popular among everyone in the world. So obviously, he will uh, aggressively push his agenda. He will push for a no-fly zone. He will push for more arms for the Polish planes to finally be transferred to Ukraine. Um, it's not because he doesn't like the West or he doesn't trust President Biden. But this is a way for him to unite people and to force the people of even uh, those living in the States to support his idea. Unfortunately, I don't think that a no-fly zone will be imposed. I also don't think that the planes will be transferred to Ukraine. But we can expect more arms. We can expect uh, anti-tanks weapons like javelins. Uh, and that's something that Ukraine right now desperately needs. And we hope that Zelensky will able be to get those. 
Alexi Surikin, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time and please do stay safe. Coming up, we've seen tens of thousands of children fleeing their home country with their parents. But what happens to Ukrainian children who don't have parents or guardians to help them leave? A director of a Jewish orphanage in southern Ukraine joins me next to talk about his Herculean efforts after the break. But first, a stunning moment on Russia's main state news channel. An anti-war protester, someone who's been identified as an employee at the network, interrupted an anchor during a news program with a poster there that said, no to war, don't believe the propaganda, you're being lied to here. Let's take a look at that moment in full. Российский премьер подчеркнул, надо усилить сотрудничество в рамках союзного государства. А на совещании в правительстве обсуждали, как сохранить доступность лекарницы. Imagine, imagine the bravery it takes to go on Russian state TV and do something like that. We have no idea what has happened to that woman. We can imagine that none of it is good and we can pray for her safety tonight. It's another reminder, though, not to blame all Russians for what is happening in Ukraine. Some of the bravest opponents of this war are Russians. We'll be back after a short break. It was one of the more heartbreaking images to come out of Ukraine. A young Ukrainian boy crying as he crossed the border on foot into Poland, trailing far behind his mother. UNICEF estimates that at least half of the 2.7 million refugees who fled Ukraine so far are children. That's over a million kids. Unfathomable. Horrific. It's the fastest growing refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. We're seeing the images every day. Parents with young children, mostly mothers, taking only what they can carry into neighboring countries like Poland or Hungary or Moldova. But some children have had to flee alone like this 11-year-old boy who's been called a hero after trekking over 600 miles by train to Slovakia with nothing but a plastic bag, his passport, and a phone number written on his hand. He's now been reunited with siblings in Bratislava. The boy's mother said she's a widow who stayed behind to care for her sick mother, who can't move on her own. She said she's grateful for those who helped save her son's life. Imagine having to make that choice. But not every child has a family. So what happens to them as Russia's war on Ukraine continues? One orphanage in Odessa is doing what it can to make sure the kids under its care are safe. Tikva Children's Home cares for homeless or abandoned Jewish children in the city on the Black Sea. As soon as Russia's invasion began, Tikva started loading up children, staff and students onto buses to get them out. So far, they've evacuated over 2,400 people with 800 now living in their refugee camp in Romania. Joining me now is Tikva CEO, Rabbi Rafael Karuskal. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Uh, Tikva started evacuating from Odessa right away. What has that been like? Did you have somewhere to go right away? Did the children understand what was happening? So good evening and thank you for having me. Um, we didn't uh, have, uh, we had plans a few weeks before the war. So, we knew that we wanted to go out um, of Ukraine if something happened. And when the bomb landed very, very close to our girls' home, we decided that we had to leave immediately. The trauma was too great for these children who had been through so much trauma. And the first step was to leave within Ukraine to Western Ukraine. And we took buses, and it was a very, very difficult journey, as you can imagine, going through places which had been bombed and the smoke and and the sirens in the background, that it was very traumatic, and we got to Western Ukraine. And for the children weren't, uh, weren't calm. They were in Ukraine. And we felt the next stage was to take them out of Ukraine. And that's when we went to, uh, we went to another trip of another 30 hours to um, um, a place in Romania where we, where we put the kids wow. up for the time being. Now that these children have been evacuated, do you have what you need to care for them in Romania? I mean, food, clothes, what else? So uh, we're grateful for the Ukrainian government for allowing us to look after their children during this period. Uh, um, we know they're fighting for their country, and we appreciate that we can do our part by looking after their children. We're, we're very grateful to the Romanian government for taking care, um, for allowing us to come in and look after the children in their country. 
we do, what do we have? The, everyone has been amazingly generous by sending over truckloads of clothes and, and, and food in order to try and make these children's lives much uh, as, as, as best as, as possible during these trying periods. And Rabbi, is Romania the last stop for these kids in Tikva's care? Is it safe for them to stay there? I know Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett welcomed Jewish orphans from Ukraine last week to Israel. Do you expect Israel, for example, or other countries to take in more Jewish orphans from Ukraine? These are Ukrainian children, and uh, um, our final stop is hopefully Odessa, Ukraine, under the current government, and that's where we'd like to go back to. And that's where the children feel most at home, and that's their... That's where their yes. uh, friends are from school and everything. So that's where that's that would that's what would like to be our final stop. Um, so that's what we're really hoping is going to happen, and we're hoping that there'll be peace very very shortly, and we'll be able to go back. But Odessa is a beautiful place, and and the kids feel they're really at home. Yes, we can only hope that too with you, Rabbi, that you are able to go back, that all of the astonishing numbers, more than 2 million people who have had to leave Ukraine can go back soon. One last question I'd like to ask you. You run a Jewish orphanage for Jewish kids. We're watching Ukrainian Jews having to flee their homes because of Russia's invasion. Yet Vladimir Putin says he's invading Ukraine to stop its so-called denazification. What do you say to him? I don't think the bombs which are landing are actually uh, um, discriminating between Jews and non-Jews. Everyone has to flee because if, you, if there's a bomb landing in your city, that's what you have to do. I didn't think it was going to happen in my lifetime. I would see babies at the border, mothers holding kids for 15 hours. My father went through this when he was uh, in, in Bergen-Belsen. He had to run away from Holland, and, and then he was taken to Germany, and then he, in the middle of the war taken. Uh, I am a prisoner of war exchange. I never thought it would happen to us in our lifetime. And it's very, very sad that we're seeing this. And I realize, as we said earlier, I'm just praying for peace. It is deeply depressing. And uh, we appreciate all the work that you do. And we appreciate you joining us on the show tonight. Rabbi Raphael Kreskel, thank you so much for your time. A question for you. What's worse? The naked disinformation and propaganda being put out by the Russian government, and also now, by the way, by the Chinese government too, about Moscow's illegal invasion of Ukraine, or the useful idiots here in the West parroting some of that disinformation and propaganda. I have to be honest, the stuff they're putting out makes no sense. Here's Tulsi Gabbard, former Democratic congresswoman, former wannabe Democratic presidential candidate, who's always had a soft spot for Russia. Remember, she was the anti-war Democrat who didn't want America to intervene in Syria, but loved the fact that Russia was bombarding Syria. Listen to her latest take on Ukraine. Here are the undeniable facts. There are 25 to 30 US funded bio labs in Ukraine. According to the US government, these bio labs are conducting research on dangerous pathogens. Ukraine is in an active war zone with widespread bombing, artillery, and shelling. And these facilities, even in the best of circumstances, could easily be compromised and release these deadly pathogens. Now, like COVID, these pathogens know no borders. Wow. Scary. Put aside the fact that the U.S. government has been conducting research in those labs, but with the aim of preventing, not spreading, dangerous pathogens, dangerous diseases like African swine fever, for example. But if Gabbard is seriously, genuinely worried that these deadly pathogens could be compromised and released by widespread bombing, artillery fire and shelling near those labs, then why doesn't she tell that to the Russians? They're the ones doing the bombing, artillery fire and shelling. They're the ones launching attacks on nuclear power plants, too. It's not the US or NATO that attacked or invaded Ukraine, something Gabbard curiously never mentions. Then there's Maria Bartiromo, Fox business anchor, who just last month before the war was suggesting Joe Biden had exaggerated the threat from Russia to Ukraine in order to distract from Hillary Clinton supposedly spying on Donald Trump. Kill me now. But who yesterday was saying this. 
Some people have told me over the weekend that they feel that at the end of the day, this administration does not see Putin as the enemy. They see him as a partner on many issues. They see him as a partner on climate change. They see him as a partner on, on the Iran deal. When is this administration going to get serious in telling Vladimir Putin, we are done with partnerships? Hold on. Your pal, Donald Trump, was the one who was desperate for a partnership with Putin. You spent the past three years telling us Joe Biden was in bed with Ukraine, that he and his son Hunter were making billions out of partnering up with the Ukrainians. But now, suddenly, Biden's in bed with Putin? You cannot make this stuff up. I mean, this is how bad the propaganda is. They can't even keep their ridiculous conspiracy theories consistent. Next. Colorado Democratic Congressman and former Army Ranger Jason Crow joins me to talk about his push to ensure the Biden administration becomes more aggressive in its support for Ukrainian defense. But before we go to break, I wanted to show you the exact moment a residential building exploded in Kyiv earlier today, startling those walking nearby. It was all captured on CCTV footage from across the street. Horrors going on. We're back after this short break not fight a war against Russia in Ukraine. Direct confrontation between NATO and Russia is World War III, something we must strive to prevent. No one wants World War III, but some lawmakers think that President Biden has been maybe a little too cautious in his approach to Russia's war in Ukraine. On Friday, 15 members of Congress sent this letter to the White House urging the president to take more decisive action to aid Ukraine and punish the Kremlin. The bipartisan group of lawmakers want additional sanctions levied against Chinese businesses with a connection to Russia, quote, in order to best ensure that Russia is unable to find the means of offsetting its exclusion from U.S. and European markets and banking systems. The letter also asked Biden to help secure more aid for Ukraine by communicating, quote, the necessity of multilateral humanitarian assistance to our allies and partners around the world. And perhaps most controversially, the letter says that we should find a way to facilitate the transfer of MiG fighter jets to Ukraine, a move that descended into chaos last week when Poland prematurely announced the US would be taking care of the handoff before the Pentagon firmly rejected it, claiming it ran too high a risk of escalating tensions between NATO and Russia. Look, it's a difficult tightrope to walk. Russia has already warned that jets or other weapons sent from NATO into Ukraine would be legitimate targets for their attack. At the same time, how can we just stand by and watch what the lawmakers rightly describe as Russia's alarming disregard for Ukrainian civilian casualties without helping, quote, supply more comprehensive air defense systems to defend Ukraine and its people? A good question. Joining me now to discuss one of the signatories of that letter to President Biden, Congressman Jason Crow from Colorado, a member of the House Armed Services Committee who served in Iraq and Afghanistan as an army ranger. Congressman, thanks for coming back on the show tonight. This letter urges the U.S. to help Poland transfer fighter jets to Ukraine. How can you be sure that won't cross Putin's invisible line and start a third world war, God forbid? Well, uh, good evening, Mady. Good to have you uh, or ha have, uh, be back on your show tonight. But here's a couple of things that I wanted to start by uh, saying and making making really clear. The first is the administration has done a very, very nice job of managing this and supporting the Ukrainians so far. But this war is far from over. And without more, the Ukrainians will not win this war unless we up our support and change the nature of our support. So now is not the time to take a victory lap. You take a victory lap when you win a battle, when you win the war. Yeah, and we are not there yet. So more has to happen and be done. Otherwise, the Ukrainians will slowly, slowly be attrited and slowly uh, lose this over time uh, in the face of a far superior Russian force. Uh, everything in war has risk. There's risk to action, but there's also risk to inaction. There's risk to doing nothing. Uh, and the risk of not changing the nature of our support, not upping it, uh, that risk is the Ukrainians will most assuredly eventually uh, lose and be overwhelmed by the Russians. Uh, and that has risk for European security, has risk for the United States, has risk for democracy. So, uh, yes, we can't be sure uh, about Putin's uh, motivations or how he's going to respond, but we should not allow Vladimir Putin to have veto power over the nature of support that we provide to Ukraine. So, I agree with you. There is a balance between risk and there is a risk to inaction versus a risk to action. But let me be blunt, just for the purposes of argument. Critics would say, critics of yours would say, the risk to inaction is maybe tens of thousands of Ukrainian dead, maybe, God forbid, 
horrifically hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian dead. The risk to action is maybe the end of human life on planet Earth. Yeah, I don't see a material difference between providing MiG-29s uh, and or more advanced air defense systems. Now, we, what we shouldn't do is get tied up and focus solely on uh, the types of weapons. What the focus should be on is capabilities. What capabilities do the Ukrainians need to defend themselves and to tip the balance of this war more in their favor? They need to achieve air superiority or to prevent the Russians from uh, achieving air superiority. And to do that will require a change in the type of support we're providing. That can be done with MiG-29 fighters. That can also be done with SA-7 and SA-10 air defense missiles uh, and an increase in support uh, to regional-based air defense systems uh, that the Ukrainians desperately need at this point. So there are ways of getting this done. Uh, well, we do need to change that. Uh, otherwise, uh, Vladimir Putin will eventually, over the long term, continue to press his advantage, which is a far superior force. Congressman, you make a fair point about, you know, where you draw the line on the MiGs. You mentioned air superiority as well. Do you extend that argument about risk and inaction and where you draw the line also to the argument over a quote-unquote no-fly zone or what others are calling an aerial combat zone? Well, I, I've long said that a no-fly zone is untenable, and I agree with the president that we shouldn't send combat troops uh, into Ukraine and be in the position of NATO or United States troops uh, or assets directly in combat with Russia. And that's what that would mean, right? Actually, achieving a no-fly zone means we send our fighters up in the air over Ukraine. Uh, we shoot down Russian jets. Uh, that would create war with Russia, and I disagree with that. But we should do everything short of that to make sure the Ukrainians win. And that is providing all of the equipment and weapons that, uh, necessary for the Ukrainians to win. And I just do not see a material difference between providing Stinger missiles, uh, SA-7s, uh, javelins, yeah. Everything we provided in providing MiGs, you know, these are all defensive capabilities, all of them, are, because Ukraine is on the defensive. They're fighting for their survival. All of these will be yes. used for the defense of Ukraine. It's a fair argument. I guess none of us, thank God, can see into Vladimir Putin's dark mind and decide where he draws that line in terms of intervention. Uh, let me ask you this, Congressman. If Russia does succeed in occupying Ukraine, what does the conflict look like from there? It could, are we looking at a possible years-long, decades-long insurgency, the kind of insurgency you fought against in Iraq? Yeah, Russia is not ready for this. It's very clear that they made faulty assumptions. They didn't think they were going to meet resistance. They didn't think the Ukrainian military and the Ukrainians themselves would rise up and fiercely fight back in the way that they have been. Uh, they've been taken by surprise. That's why uh, their invasion has been stumbling and bumbling and, and very brutal to their military, where the Ukrainians have been able to, to slow it down significantly to date. Uh, so uh, this is going to be ugly for them. They have a force of 200,000 soldiers. Now, on average, about 20 percent, maybe 30 percent of any given force is actually a combat force. Uh, the rest are support services, logistics and supplies and maintenance. So maybe the Russians have 60 to 80,000 combat troops at, ma at max, ready and at their disposal. And they're going to try to conquer and to actually occupy a country the size of Texas with over 40 million Ukrainians. They can't do it. Uh, and that includes several cities in excess of 1 million. Urban fighting is brutal. It absorbs combat power. Uh, during uh, the invasion of Iraq, I was a, a young infantry lieutenant leading a platoon of paratroopers in some of the, the toughest battles, urban battles, that we had during that invasion. Uh, and it just soaks up infantrymen. It soaks up armor units. Uh, they do not have the forces at their disposal currently to get this done. And that's why he's looking to Syria. That's why he's actively looking around the world to what few friends he has to help supplement his force. Congressman, there's a conspiracy theory that's starting to get some traction here, especially online. Uh, the theory claims, without any real evidence, that the U.S. was developing a weapon or a virus in secret biolabs across Ukraine, a claim that Russia is now pushing to. Your former colleague in the House and another veteran of Iraq, Tulsi Gabbard, was pushing a version of that theory on Twitter over the weekend. What do you say to her? Yeah, this is just crazy stuff. I mean, we are in an era of disinformation and misinformation and conspiracy theories. Uh, we deal with it with QAnon. We deal, dealt with it on January 6. Uh, it has become a, a fundamental part of the Republican base, unfortunately. 
Uh, and I can't uh, just speak to what's going on inside of the mind of some of my colleagues, you know, a, a small handful of them that, uh, frankly, are supporting Vladimir Putin, supporting Russia, uh, and helping to per perpetuate their lies and their conspiracy theories uh, in the face of a devastating and brutal invasion of a sovereign and democratic nation. Uh, I have nothing to say for them. Uh, it's just not true. Uh, and we have to focus on the truth. We have to focus on supporting uh, our Ukrainian friends and making sure that they can survive uh, and reestablish their democracy. One last question for you, Congressman. Does the U.S., or doesn't the U.S., let me frame it that way, have a much greater responsibility to help Ukrainian refugees, and not just Ukrainian refugees, but refugees across the board? The Biden administration just recently uh, decided to revoke the use of Title 42 against uh, unaccompanied minors at the southern border, but they're still using Title 42, this Trump-era, Stephen Miller-devised ruling that prevents anyone from claiming asylum at the southern border. They get ejected immediately uh, because of COVID, apparently, under Title 42. So I just wonder, shouldn't we be taking in more Ukrainian refugees and basically looking again at our entire refugee border policy? Yeah, the answer is undoubtedly yes. There's just no uh, other way to, to, to talk about this. I mean, I, I represent one of the most diverse districts in the nation. Nearly 20% of my constituents are immigrants or refugees who are born outside of this country. I have over 160 languages and dialects spoken in my district. And what I know is it's a source of great strength, that we are stronger and more vibrant and a, a better community as a result of the contributions of those immigrants and refugees. And America is at its best and we are strongest when we open up our doors to those who are escaping oppression, escaping danger and trying to reestablish our lives. Uh, we have never regretted in the history of our country doing that. We've always been better off doing that. Uh, and, and there are opportunities to do that everywhere in the world, and there's opportunities to do that right now. So I'm going to continue to push the administration to raise the refugee cap and do everything necessary to make sure we're opening our doors to Ukrainian refugees and refugees from around the world. Congressman Jason Crow, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate it. One quick and arguably not that surprising update on the attack on the Capitol on January the 6th. Ginny Thomas, the wife of Conservative Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, told the Washington Free Beacon that she did indeed attend former President Donald Trump's Stop the Steal rally on January the 6th of last year. She was there in D.C. at the Ellipse. But she adds that she left before Trump spoke because, she says, she got cold. This is notable, of course, for a few obvious and disturbing reasons, but it's also important to remember the other recent context about her that surfaced. A number of outlets have recently published deeper dives into Ginny Thomas, her political beliefs, her work with conservative groups involved in Supreme Court cases, her lobbying of the Trump administration. And let's not forget, Justice Clarence Thomas was the only justice to rule against the release of White House records surrounding the attack on the Capitol. His lone dissent, of course, was overruled, which allowed the House January 6th committee investigating the riot to get their hands on a mountain of documents from the National Archive. Question, at what point do Democrats raise the issue of Clarence Thomas's clear conflicts of interest here? Maybe even, dare I say, raise the I-word, impeachment. Next. As we watch Russia's war unfold in Ukraine, I'd be remiss to not also talk about Ukraine's far-right extremist problem and how those groups are actually using this conflict as an opportunity to mobilize and recruit and what the West needs to be doing here as we support Ukraine. That conversation with an expert after a short break. Don't go away. In the 1980s, during the Soviet invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, no one in the West really disputed the Afghans' right to defend their homeland from invaders. And as we all know, the U.S. was particularly supportive of the quote-unquote freedom fighters there. Here's President Reagan in his 1986 State of the Union address. We're not alone, freedom fighters. America will support you with moral and material assistance. Your right not just to fight and die for freedom, but to fight and win freedom. Reagan didn't just voice support for the Mujahideen. The U.S. government spent millions of dollars a year funneling arms to them, from machine guns to grenade launchers to anti-aircraft missiles. By the late 80s, it had amounted to billions of dollars' worth of military support. In 1988, the New York Times reported it was one of the biggest operations ever mounted by the CIA. 
The Afghan resistance even got the Hollywood treatment in Rambo 3. Remember that? Sylvester Stallone befriending Mujahideen fighters whom his best friend was training to take on the Russians. The Russians did pull out of Afghanistan eventually, but there were unintended consequences. Today, no one would dispute that the glorified Afghan resistance also included some, shall we say, less heroic, more extreme, often foreign groups of fighters who would use those very weapons and training against the West once their war with the Soviets was over. It's not the first time that that's happened in history. And it's also something we need to keep in mind today during this conflict in Ukraine. Back in 2020, former FBI agent Ali Soufan, who once led the hunt for al-Qaeda, and then Congressman Max Rose, together warned that just as jihadists exploited conflicts in Afghanistan, white supremacists are using the conflict in Ukraine as a laboratory and training ground. In a separate report, Soufan wrote that Ukraine had become a hub in the network of transnational white supremacy extremism and that almost twice as many foreign fighters were traveling to join the civil war in Ukraine than to Afghanistan in the 80s. Just last week, extremism expert Cynthia Miller, Cynthia Miller Idris, wrote in a story for MSNBC.com that, quote, among the well-meaning citizens lining up to fight for Ukraine are some global volunteers with links to white supremacist and far-right extremism, and that in recent years, global neo-Nazi fighters have sought combat experience with defense militias in Ukraine, most notably the Azov Battalion. Vladimir Putin has cynically tried to capitalize on those small pockets of extremism, on groups like Azov, saying one reason for his invasion was the need to denazify Ukraine. It's absurd, of course. Ukraine is a democracy in which far-right parties failed to get more than 2% of the vote in the 2019 elections. And as Cynthia Miller Idris and others have pointed out, the vast majority of fighters going to Ukraine today have no known ties to white supremacist extremism. This is, by and large, a legitimate resistance effort against a foreign invasion. But as we continue to send arms into Ukraine, we can't just forget what happened in Afghanistan. As Cynthia Miller Idris also wrote last week, the conflict in Ukraine raises serious risks for recruitment and radicalization in violent white supremacist extremist movements in ways that may ripple outward long after this horrific conflict is resolved. Joining me now is Cynthia Miller Idris. She's a professor in the School of Public Affairs at American University, where she directs the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab. She's also the author of the 2020 book, Hate in the Homeland, The New Global Far Right and she's an MSNBC opinion columnist. Cynthia, thanks so much for coming back on the show tonight. First of all, this is a hard topic to discuss, isn't it? Because you have Vladimir Putin on the one hand, pushing false claims of Nazis running Ukraine, when in fact, Ukraine's democratically elected president is a Jewish man who lost family in the Holocaust. And on the other hand, you have Ukraine that does have a recent history and a World War II history of being home to various white supremacist groups and militias and even right-wing political parties. It's a delicate subject to raise, as you have, in the midst of this horrific Russian invasion. Absolutely. And thanks for having me back. It's it's great great to be here. I mean, I think just as you've done and, and as I think the media has been treating this issue pretty responsibly uh, as the news has come out that some white supremacists and neo-Nazis have, in fact, mobilized and are mobilizing to head to Ukraine as foreign fighters or to, or to exploit this opportunity to recruit and mobilize. At the same time, I think we have done in the media, uh, what we're seeing is, is, a, is a pretty responsible take on this by consistently pointing out that this does not mean in any means that that, that propaganda coming from Putin uh, about denazification and the need for, for not, you know, denazification is in any means true. I mean, it's patently false. And so this is a minority issue. It's a, it's a minority group of, of violent extremists yes. uh, that are kind of embedded in part of this, but it doesn't mean that that, that holds in any case any, any kind of truth. One of the most prominent groups, as I mentioned, Cynthia, is the Azov Battalion. They're a far-right neo-Nazi group based in Mariupol, partly the, the besieged city that Russia is trying to take right now. The reality is they fought against the Russians so well in 2014 that they became incorporated into the National Guard of Ukraine. Last month, the National Guard shared a video of a fighter greasing bullets in pig fat, warning Russian Muslim soldiers, Chechen fighters, that they will not go to heaven. How influential is the Azov Battalion, both within Ukraine and in global white supremacist networks that you study? You've written about foreign fighters going out there. Is Azov part of the appeal for the foreign neo-Nazis who go there? 
It has been part of the appeal over the last eight or nine years. I mean, I think they have uh, had had this appeal within the, the global white supremacist youth movement around also this idea of taking to the streets and being a, a fighter, a combat fighter, uh, engagement in, in mixed martial arts and combat sports training, um, live streaming of tournaments, all of those kinds of things are kind of all caught up in a youth cultural appeal of that Asaf battalion, even after they formally lost left those uh, extremist ties behind and became incorporated into the uh, National Guard of Ukraine. But we still saw with those videos last week that there are components, just like there are in the U.S. military and among veteran communities, yes. and there are in Germany and elsewhere, uh, problems with persistent white supremacist or far-right extremist attitudes or actions within those ranks. And so, you know, again, it's this delicate subject of, of trying to point out that this is a persistent problem across the West, across North America and Western Europe, and Europe that we have uh, problems in the military with extremism and white supremacist extremism. Ukraine has been a hub for that, but again, not in any means saying that the majority of people are, are in any way, uh, you know, that any kind of denazification is needed. It's, it's a minority issue, but still a problematic one. Yeah, it's bizarre to hear some on the far right and far left say, well, we can't support Ukraine because there are neo-Nazis fighting in Ukraine. As you say, pretty sure there are neo-Nazis in the U.S. military, in various militaries in the West as well, sadly. Uh, that's the reality of the world we live in right now. I have to ask a question, though, about how the American far right divides up when it comes to Ukraine and Russia. Because, as you say, there's a lot of far right people who want to go out and fight on the side of the Azov Battalion, who want to go and mobilize in Ukraine and have been for years. On the other hand, we also know that Vladimir Putin is a bit of a hero to a lot of far-right people around the world, whether it's people on Fox News, whether it's far-right political parties in Europe, like the National Front and the Italian far-right. Is the global far-right divided between wanting to support Vladimir Putin and wanting to support the Azov types in Ukraine? I'm kind of confused. They're very divided. I mean, it's one of the one of the things I think to really understand in general about the far right is that not only is it a spectrum, but it's a very fragmented spectrum, which is often best characterized by tremendous infighting. I mean, when you look back in even in the U.S. at something like Unite the Right in 2017, that rally in Charlottesville was trying to pull them together across really factions that don't agree with each other. And so it's no surprise that in the case of Ukraine, we see the same thing, where you have some issuing praise for Putin. They like his authoritarianism. They like his anti-West, anti-LGBTQ, anti-feminism. They like all of those kinds of things about him. Uh, and then others, pro you know, propagating conspiracy theories about uh, the Jewish leadership, you know, the Jewish identity of the leadership in Ukraine uh, are related to that, uh, to the war. Um, and then, of course, you have groups that are now and actively supporting, wanting to go fight, uh, joining the fight, uh, rec being recruited for foreign fighting, fund, you know, creating fundraising, all kinds of issues like that. So I think that's very typical among the far right. And, and we're actually quite lucky among those of us who try to combat the far right that they are quite fragmented because they're not very unified, they're not, they're not very organized, and they don't have one central yes. idea. They often disagree. Cynthia Miller Idris, we'll have to leave it there. It's a, it's a difficult subject to cover, an important one, so we appreciate having your expertise to help us do so. Thank you. We began this hour referencing Russia's horrific wars in Chechnya. Well, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky referenced those wars in a new video out tonight, saying that Russia's army has lost more troops, he says, in 19 days in Ukraine than it did in both Chechen wars. Zelensky also urged Russian troops to surrender saying, quote, we will treat you like humans ought to be treated with dignity, not the way you were treated in your army and not the way your army treats ours. Choose, he says. And before we go tonight, we wish we could greet all of you the way that these two Ukrainian children were greeted as they arrived for their first day of school in a town near Naples, Italy. Have a watch. Bye, bye, bye. Absolutely beautiful scenes there, the best of humanity in the darkest of times. If only all refugees from everywhere around the world could be welcomed that warmly. That does it for me tonight. 
Tomorrow, we'll debate the question of a no-fly zone over Ukraine with the former U.S. ambassadors to Ukraine and NATO. They take very different positions on that. And make sure to join us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. And I'll see you back here, as I say, tomorrow night, as ever, live, 7 p.m. Eastern, right here on The Choice from MSNBC. For now, from me, good night. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.